Welcome to the Potter Blog site for Wednesday, May 16th, 2012. Now this evening we have another alert of a potential recent radioactive recriticality slash fire at Fukushima. And we base this on detections, recent detections of uh, radioactive soot in the United States. Now, there is uncertainties in this, and if you stay until the end of the video, we'll explain some of these uncertainties in simple terminology. But uh, at the moment, we're still analyzing the data, and more details will follow, and we'll eventually release all the uh, raw data, hopefully within the week. Uh, for the time being, this is what we know now, and that is between April 29th, that's Sunday, 2012, and May 8th, 2012, the following short half-life fallout products were identified in a sample. Now this is a uh, partial list. Now these are all typically soot products, the result of uh, what you would find in the air after a radioactive fire. Uh, barium-140, and it was identified at nearly the 95% confidence level. Also identified was its daughter product, LA-140, and it was detected at below the 95% confidence level. Now, all the rest of these products I'm about to mention uh, were detected at below the 95% confidence level. And that is also CE-141, RU-103, ZR-95, and its daughter product, NB-95. Now, these are all short half-life. Uh, for example, in the case of barium, its entire decay chain from uh, parent through all daughters to stable product is no longer than, uh, the half-life is no longer than 14.4 days. So, if you look at the detection of barium, and even though its daughter is at less than 95% confidence, and you detect all these other soot products, and other parents and daughters, this is a, a strong indication of uh, a radioactive fire and recriticality in a very recent time period. Now, an additional fact was in the same sample, iodine-131 was also detected uh, again, at below the 95% uh, confidence level. Now, the sample here was basically a 100 square inch area that was uh, frozen to minus 20 degrees Celsius, uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was exposed to the atmosphere for uh, 20 to 30 minutes, and uh, then it was sealed. Now that's where we believe this contamination came in, was in this uh, 20 to 30 minute window where this uh, uh, sample was exposed to uh, fresh air and a lot of frost built up on the sample. So we strongly suspect a recent recriticality and fire at Fukushima. Now since we posted this uh, blog uh, a few hours ago at Max, we've had a couple of questions and uh, one of those questions were could this be from a uh, from a fuel pool uh, catching fire? Now, again, we can't say this with uh, certainty, but also that was detected in these samples, which wasn't listed above, was iron 59 at uh, below the 95% confidence level, and uh, uh, chromium 51 again at below the 95% confidence level. Now, these have half lives of uh, 45 days and 27 days. So again, they're indicative of something recent occurring. They're also indicative of, of uh, that these might be fuel rods that were involved in this fire. Now again, there are uncertainties, but this is such a strong case that if we had unlimited budget, like the government who has access to your wallet, we would follow up on this and uh, do further analysis. But from a risk mitigation standpoint, it's wise to take risk mitigation uh, uh, procedures. Now, one other interesting thing in here in this uh, uh, question from Nemo is that uh, this person stated that they didn't think that anyone would admit if there was a uh, radioactive uh, fuel fire in one of the fuel pools in Fukushima. Yeah. I seriously hope that's not the case. I, I would think that we would be informed at least somebody would inform us. But uh, there is one interesting thing that's occurring right now, and that's in Baltimore, Maryland. And the, uh, the National Nuclear Security Agency is uh, doing overflights of Baltimore, have been for, I think, uh, yesterday and today. 
and uh, they're sampling for fallout. Just so happens that the jet stream and some heavy rains have been over that area uh, very recently. So if you're trying to measure what the fallout deposition was from a radioactive soot plume carried across the uh, jet stream uh, in the last week or so, last two weeks, then uh, Baltimore might be a good place to test for it. But again, that could be all coincidence. But uh, for the moment, uh, I want to go back and explain what these 95% confidence levels mean. Uh, I'll explain it in terms of a, uh, say you had a poison detector. And this detector could tell you whether or not your drink had rat poison in it. And it would tell you how much rat poison was in your drink. So if your detector was set up, and it would, if your detector detected one tablespoon of rat poison in your drink, that would be, the, it would limit that at the 95% confidence level. That means if the detector spotted one tablespoon of rat poison in your drink, you could be 95% certain that there was rat poison in your drink. Now say that the detector detected a full cup of rat poison in your drink. Well, in that case, you could be 99.9999999 so on percent certain that you had rat poison in your drink. Never goes to 100%. There's always a uh, an uncertainty. Now, on the other hand, since a tablespoon of rat poison is a 95% uncertainty, say your rat poison detector detected just a teaspoon of rat poison in your drink. Well, your your uh, rat poison detector would then tell you, oh, there's only a 50% certainty that you have rat poison in your drink. So these terminologies are used in uh, for lots of times in the hard scientists where you have to know within a, a relative certainty how much rat poison is in your drink or whatever it is you're studying. But from a risk mitigation perspective, it, what, what scientists typically do is at the 95% confidence level, so if you detected a tablespoon of rat poison in your drink, they'll say, oh, we have detected rat poison. If you detect less than 95% confidence, if you detect half a teaspoon of rat poison, they will call that a non-detect. Instead of telling you that there's a 50% chance, they will call that a non-detect. So if somebody hands you a drink and they run their rat poison scanner on it and it comes up with a teaspoon of rat poison in there, they have the option to tell you that A, it was a non-detect, I couldn't detect rat poison in your drink, or they could say there's a 50-50 chance that there's rat poison in your drink. Now, which one would you want to know? Would you want to drink the, would you feel better drinking 50-50% chance of rat poison if it was called a non-detect? That's where the risk mitigation aspect comes in. But if we look at these, you know, these 95% confidence levels are uh, based on single variant single variant, which means when they calculated this 95% confidence level for the, the barium-140 detection, they didn't include the fact that uh, its daughter product was detected. Same with the ZR95. When they detected it, and it's less than 95% confidence level, they didn't include the fact in that confidence level, they didn't make it a multi multivariate analysis that uh, its daughter product, N95, was in there. The same thing is these are all like fingers on a hand. You, know, you detect four fingers, pretty sure that there's a fifth finger on that hand too, a thumb. So even though individually some of these are below the 95% confidence level, although this barium is really close to the 95% confidence level, when you start summing it up and look at the totality of the system, you get the, a really strong indication that there's something really nasty going on in our air especially when you consider that this uh, contamination was in the United States and that it resulted from a short exposure to uh, airborne contaminants, we believe. So, as I said, you know, we're hopefully within the week we will uh, present, give the full data, all the raw data, let you know exactly where everything's, uh, where this information how this information originated and 
uh, what's going on. But this is that is the totality of what we know at, at the moment, and it's our best description of the uncertainties. And so it's wise to take risk mitigation. Good night.